Here on the East Coast, 9 a.m. on the West Coast, I'm John Bachman. Thanks for joining us. The Republican Party deeply divided today over impeaching President Trump. And even though uh, the sitting president is the one who's been impeached twice, the GOP's center of gravity seems to remain within the MAGA world. Will Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell twist the knife of Nancy Pelosi's article of impeachment? That remains an open question at this hour. The House voting 232 to 197 to impeach President Trump yesterday for incitement of insurrection. Articles of impeachment have only passed the House four times. That's happened twice just in the last year. Now, 10 Republicans joined with the Democrats in a statement released yesterday. Uh, McConnell wrote this, quote, I have not made a final decision on how I will vote, and I intend to listen to the legal arguments when they are presented in the Senate. So when will that be? Let's go now to Newsmax White House correspondent Emerald Robinson, who is live at the White House. So Emerald McConnell's views here first reported in the New York Times, and this looks very calculated, just like everything else McConnell does. Exactly. Nothing, nothing leaks out of there without McConnell's consent, right? So uh, what we do know is that a trial is not going to take place before inaugura inauguration day. McConnell's been very explicit about that, saying there's just not enough time. But he has played coy on these, reporting, these reports that he would actually vote to convict the president. You read that statement that he put out yesterday saying there's a lot of speculation that he hasn't made up his mind. But people we talked to seem to think that that is something McConnell would like to do, but he's weighing the political calculus. And there's a lot of calculus to weigh because while there might have been 10 members of the GOP in the House who voted for impeachment, by and large, the support wasn't there, right? Because over 90% of House Republicans actually sided with the president. Let's also take a look at a recent Axios Ipsos poll that talks about uh, Republican voters. It broke them down between Trump voters and uh, more establishment type uh, Republican voters. Voters, and the president still enjoys quite the amount of support. In fact, this poll shows that um, the majority of Republicans still think that the president was right to challenge the election laws. They also support him, and they don't actually blame him for the Capitol, uh, the, what went down in the Capitol last week. A lot of them, the majority, also would like to see him be the candidate in 2024. Now, McConnell. Uh, clearly would like to reclaim uh, the Republican Party and usurp that from the president. He sees impeachment as a possible way to purge, quote unquote, the president and Trumpism altogether. But based on this information and other polls from this week that shows that by and large, overwhelmingly, Republicans would like to see the president be the candidate again in 2024. This creates quite a conundrum for the Senate Majority Leader as he heads into this uh, this trial, this impeachment trial for what is still a extremely popular Republican president. Yeah, one John? thing to note too, Emerald, very interesting, without use of his uh, Twitter bully pulpit, President Trump still only getting 10 Republicans to vote for this impeachment, that number much lower than a lot of people expected. We'll talk more about that with John Gizzi coming up. We appreciate your report as right. always, Emerald. We'll see you in the next hour as well. Let's also welcome in now today former governor of Illinois, Rod Blagojevich, and civil rights attorney Leo Terrell, host of the Leo Terrell podcast. Gentlemen, great to have you both with us. As always, always appreciate these conversations. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you for having us. All right, so uh, first to you, Leo. What do you think about McConnell's decision here? And, you know, he obviously left this open-ended. McConnell, obviously a very careful tactician. Everything he does is calculated. I don't necessarily mean that in a negative way every time, but he's obviously thought this through. He clearly wants to leverage this to get President Trump to toe the line, doesn't he? Yes, he does. But let me be very clear. Uh, the, the Republican Party supports Donald J. Trump not Mitch McConnell, not Liz Cheney. And what the Republicans don't understand is Donald Trump has changed the Republican Party, John. It's a different party. Mitch McConnell represents the old country club Republican Party. That's not why I joined the Republican Party. I joined the Republican Party for Donald J. Trump. The Democrats, they use the impeachment process to weaponize it against Donald Trump. They are afraid of Donald Trump. Those poll numbers indicate that Donald Trump is very, very popular. I submit to you, John and the governor, on January 21st, 2021, I'm working on the reelection of Donald J. Trump for 2024.
Well, what about you, Governor Blagojevich? I mean, this is the thing, too. You know, once upon a time, you supported President Reagan. You, of course, a Democrat. And that was the appeal of President Reagan. But that's the same thing Leo's talking about with President Trump, too. This was not a marriage of convenience. This was a marriage of necessity. If Republicans were ever going to win, they needed these type of blue-collar, middle American Republican voters to join the party when they had been voting for Democrats. So, you know, if this does happen, this... Uh, it's divorce, if you will, from Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump and these two wings of the party. There, there is no real party left. There's no chance of them winning. Well, if this happens, the Republican Party, as we know it, will, will not survive. President Trump has done exactly as you and Leo have said. He's expanded the base of the Republican Party, not just blue-collar working people, but uh, African-Americans and Latinos as well. Uh, he's a different kind of a political leader. And because he's realigning po American politics and changing the nature of how people vote. He's a threat to the political establishment, the entrenched establishment in Washington. And let's face it, with all due respect to Senator McConnell, he has a lot more in common with Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi than he does with uh, President Trump, because President Trump has become the voice, and rightfully so, of we the people against that established, entrenched place, Washington, D.C., that's controlled and run by professional career politicians who've been there for 100 years. Yeah, and you know, it's not just uh, President Trump being involved in uh, any potential fight with Mitch McConnell or being potentially the future of the Republican Party in 2024, uh, but also uh, some of these these Republicans, Leo, who join this impeachment to, with Democrats, they're gonna be primaried next time around. So what does that look like? You know, 2022 is supposed to be a chance for Republicans really to make their mark in the House and win back a bunch of seats and take back control of the House. Uh, but again, if this infighting continues, does that put that at risk? No, I don't think so, because I guarantee you, those 10 Republicans, they're going to be primary. I'm working on that right now. What I'm telling you right now is what the establishment does not understand, John, is people like Donald Trump. They got to get outside of the Washington beltway. You look in middle America, people gravitate towards Donald Trump. And I guarantee you, these 10 Republicans will be primary by Trump Republicans, not a far right extreme Republican, Trump Republicans. Trump Republicans are likable, John. And I'll tell you right now, as, as the governor said, he has enlarged the base of the Republican Party. It's not the old party. These 10 Republicans are going to be primary. And I'll tell you right now, the Republicans will take the House in 2022. Well, it's looking good for them if you look at the map projecting ahead on, on that front. And so it would be a surprise if they don't do that. A little concern, Leo, based on what we saw in Georgia, how the GOP infighting kind of affected that race. But we will see. All right, let's talk about something else here, and that's age. Not a topic we're supposed to talk about very often here. But, you know, with all due respect to the House Speaker and our future president, they are getting old. Baby boomers make up nearly 70 percent of Congress. Uh, their generation, though, only makes up 21 percent of all Americans. There are seven senators who are at least 80 years old. Senator Chuck Grassley is 87. They're talking about him maybe running again. Uh, Vermont Senator Patrick Leahy is 80. Bernie Sanders is 80. Mitch McConnell getting up there as well. Dianne Feinstein at 87 as well. I mean, we need term limits, guys. Maybe even age limits. Uh, we need some fresh blood, don't we, Leo? Oh, I think there's no question about it. But let me tell you right now, the difference between the, the senators that you just put up on the screen, they love power. That's the swamp. Right. Donald Trump loves America. He puts America first. And there's a distinction. I don't look at Donald Trump's age. I look at these other candidates because they just love to be in Washington and rub elbows at these wine and cheese parties. Right. And, you know, when you're in Washington that long, it's hard not to be on every side of major of every major issue. You know, that's the case with Joe Biden. We don't know what we're going to get uh, with Joe Biden. But, Rod, you know, you know this very well, how dangerous this can be having somebody in power for so long. Just yesterday uh, in the Illinois State House, major news, right? Mike Madigan is has been ousted as Speaker of the House. He was in that position for 40 years. He was 78 years or is 78 years old, had served longer and in the state house and as a speaker than anyone in u.s history the new guy is a guy named state representative emmanuel welch chris welch is his name the change comes after months of scandal and get this investigation into lobbying practices not for this guy the new guy here but for the old guy madigan so how big is this you said this is similar to like the berlin wall coming down right well that's right the berlin went, the berlin wall finally fell here in illinois madigan's been there speaker <laughs> madigan has been in charge uh, for nearly 40 years. It's been one-man rule in Illinois. 
Uh, I fought him every step of the way. It's all about the establishment with him. I would say this about the age issue and Madigan and McConnell and Dianne Feinstein and Pelosi and Biden and the others. I believe it's less about the number of years that you have in your life and more about the number of years that you've been in the establishment, whether it's in Washington or Springfield. And when they stay as long as they stay, Biden's been there since 1973. Madigan has been in Illinois government since 1972, been the speaker nearly 40 years. Pelosi, we, I can go down the list. When they're there that long, they think they own the government. It's just a natural thing that happens with these people. And they don't hear the real people back home. Leo said it exactly right. And after you know years and years of catering to the same lobbyists and the special interests and the political establishment, that's what they become. They become these establishment creatures. There is, in fact, a swamp. It isn't just in Washington. It's in state governments, too. Yeah. And I'm on... I would challenge anybody to check my record back in 1993 when I first, uh, 92, when I was first elected state lawmaker, I filed a bill supporting term limits. And I do believe term limits is, and that was is maybe, essential. Not just maybe for- that was your biggest sin, too, Governor Blagojevich, was going <laughs> against the grain. That's how I'm serious. That When you look into it, you start yeah. pushing against the system. They start pushing back. You can't beat City Hall. And sometimes it's even harder to beat a state house. Uh, but it's always good to see a turnover after a guy has been in power for 40 years. Get some fresh blood in there. Governor Blagojevich, great to see you as always. Leo, we always appreciate your time as well. We'll talk soon again, guys. All right, coming up, President Trump, or I should say we're going to move on now to the security situation. President Trump urging all Americans to stop the violence. This ahead of next week's inauguration for Joe Biden. There is never a justification for violence. No excuses. No exceptions. America is a nation of laws. Those who engaged in the attacks last week will be brought to justice. Every American deserves to have their voice heard in a respectful and peaceful way. That is your First Amendment right. But I cannot emphasize that there must be no violence, no law-breaking, and no vandalism of any kind. All right, the president's message of peace comes as law enforcement officials across the country continue to make arrests in connection to last week's violent riots on security ahead of next week's inauguration. Let's go now to Newsmax national correspondent Logan Raddick, who is inside the Capitol, along with a lot of National Guardsmen. Well, that's right, John. And then also you have the National Park Service just releasing a statement denying reports that they're planning on closing the National Mall to the public on Inauguration Day. The National Park Service says they've yet to make a decision in that regard. But as you mentioned, a lot of National Guardsmen here. And law enforcement says that after the successful siege, as they're calling it, of the Capitol, domestic terrorists are more likely to be emboldened for future attacks across the country and right here in Washington, D.C. So that's why you see that heavy presence here. But there's also the fact that investigators Through looking at the evidence, there's suggestions that this might have all been pre-planned and not just a peaceful protest turned into a riot. Now, you also have a group of 30 House Democrats, and they're calling on Capitol security forces to make public a little bit more information as to what a suspicious, as they're calling it, tour group was doing here the day before it turned violent. Those House Democrats say the group could only gain a group of Democrats led by New Jersey's Mikey Sherrill write, quote, the visitors encountered by some of the members of Congress in this letter appeared to be associated with a rally at the White House the following day. Members of the group that attacked the Capitol seem to have an unusually detailed knowledge of the layout of the Capitol complex and quote, adding that their presence was suspicious. Ohio Democrat Tim Ryan says there isn't enough transparency. We, we fund the Capitol Police. Congress funds the Capitol Police through the Appropriations Committee. Uh, and, and we, I think, deserve to know and understand what the hell is going on. The representatives are asking Capitol Police and other security officials to confirm the availability of a logbook to see if any of those people gained entry with the help of lawmakers. The FBI is looking into leads that some Trump rally attend. And there's another point of contention here in the House, the ability for lawmakers to protect themselves. We know Colorado Republican Lauren Boebert uh, wants to carry a firearm on her in order to make sure that she is safe while she is here on Capitol Hill. But House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has implemented a rule against that with metal detectors up 
as you head onto the House floor. If you violate that, it'll be $5,000 for the first offense. The second offense would level a $10,000 fine. So if you want to bring a gun to work here at the House of Representatives, you better have uh, that checkbook opened up, too. Yeah, John. fines for guns and fines for not wearing masks. Lots of rules, new rules up there on Capitol Hill. Logan, we'll see you again in the next hour. Thanks so much. Well, Thank you me. can deplatform celebrities and presidents, but can you deplatform a platform? We'll discuss that and what's going on with Parler and all the social media censorship. Welcome in Vivek Ramaswamy in the next segment. We'll talk about that with him next. Welcome back. Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey took to his social media platform to defend banning President Trump. Kind of. Dorsey's saying, I do not celebrate or feel pride in our having to ban President Trump from Twitter or how we got here. After a clear warning, we'd take this action. We made a decision with the best information we had based on threats to physical safety, both on and off Twitter. Now, free speech friendly social media site Parler has also been to platform. Parler CEO John Matz tells Reuters they may never come back. Ryle Vance Science is he's also the author of the upcoming new book, Wokenomics, Inside Corporate America's Social Justice Scam. Vivek, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. The uh, revised title for my book is actually Woke Inc. Woke Inc. OK, I like yeah. that. Shorter, Thanks. sharper, no stronger. Always better. Thank you. So Jack Dorsey claiming that his ban on President Trump wasn't celebrated, but it does seem like lots of Silicon Valley is celebrating the defeat or, you know, you know the ceremonial uh, execution, I guess you could say, of Parler, really. Uh, so, you know, is this fair? We you know we see people being deplatformed, but here with Parler, you actually have a platform being yeah. uh, deplatformed. Right. So, so a lot of people are frustrated and talking about going in the direction of regulation. I offer a different solution. I wrote in the Wall Street Journal earlier this week that we actually have to recognize the heart of what happened here, which was that Congress co-opted Silicon Valley through the back door to do what it couldn't do directly through the front door under the Constitution. And they did it in two ways. There was the carrot, which was Section 230, which says that these companies, unlike normal companies, can't be sued in state court, even if they remove the, the individual users from their site, even if they deplatform people. Same thing applies to deplatforming Parler. But at the same time, they also used a threat, congressional threats to say, if you actually don't remove hate speech, if you don't remove the kind of speech that we don't like, then we're actually gonna come after you with even further regulation. So when Silicon Valley went out and did that, they also got a pat on the back at the end of it from the liberal wing of Congress. To me, that is actually state action in the clothing of private, mantle, in the mantle of private enterprise, but it's not actually capitalism working the way it should. So the conventional wisdom is you can't sue these companies for the first amendment because they're private companies the view I put out in the Wall Street Journal this week is that actually on solid legal grounds with strong precedents, you can. And, and, you know, the, the thing, too, is about using a law you know, that was written in 1996 to try and deal with a very 21st century problem uh, with these social media sites. This, is, again, I think is problem problematic with Congress is, you know, they don't want to write a new law. And there is so much now lobbying influence in Washington that even if there was political will to do so, it would be very difficult to get it done. Yeah, I mean, this is, Section 230 is what I call a category of corporate privileges, right? It's crony capitalism 2.0. These firms in the 1990s lobbied for the kind of law without which they would not be the behemoths they are today. But now the debate about whether to repeal Section 230 works in their favor yet again, because if we did repeal Section 230, all that does is it stifles future competition. Problem? Today, in 2020, it's a different problem. It's the combination of big government working with big business. Right. The private That's partner. The liberty. The, pro the private uh, public partnerships here. Now, you know, if you look at the antitrust legislation, the Sherman antitrust laws, you know, one of the things that, that companies are not allowed to do is work together to stifle competition here. And this seems like a very obvious case of that happening. Yeah, it is. But it's a tricky case to press because these big tech CEOs, I think they ran circles around Congress when yeah. they were called to testify. I think what it was last August. And the reason they did it is because antitrust law is designed to protect consumers from price gouging. Now, what's happening here is, of course, these companies are making products available widely, sometimes for free, at, at very little cost to consumers, at least. There's plenty of consumer choice. But the real heart of the problem is it's not a pricing cartel in the way we thought about the Rockefellers in the last century. This is an ideological cartel. It's a monopoly of ideas, not a monopoly of products. And again, we haven't, as conservatives, as Americans, wrapped ourselves wrapped around our heads around a new paradigm to deal with this uniquely 21st century problem when we're still using the vocabulary from the 20th century. And so I think that we need to think about new ways about reviving the constitutional principles of free speech 
but bringing them to meet the, the moment in a way that antitrust law just doesn't quite do, at least not the antitrust law of the 20th century. Yeah, when you have Orrin Hatch asking questions about how Mark Zuckerberg makes his money, the question that simple in this situation. I know we've come a long way since then. That was just a few years ago. But again, it does seem like there are very few members in Congress who actually have you know, the knowledge base to, to handle this problem. But that great to see you. We'll have you back. So much to talk about here. This is not going away, this issue. We look forward to our continuing this conversation down the line. Thanks for having me. All right. And remember, it's Woke Inc., the book, Woke Inc., from Vivek Ramaswamy. Got that right this time. All right. COVID crisis update here. The CEO of Moderna now says the coronavirus is uh, in the following hour as well. We're also going to talk about the Republican Party now facing rage from both pro-Trump and anti-Trump voters. Where will the party go next? Don't go away. He must not remain in power one moment longer. It's always been about getting the president, no matter what. It's an obsession. If inciting a deadly insurrection is not enough to get a president impeached, then what is? I call bullcrap when I hear the Democrats demanding unity. Sadly, they are only unified in hate. If we fail to remove a white supremacist president who incited a white supremacist insurrection. Some have cited the metaphor that the president lit the flame. Well, they lit actual flames, actual fires, and we Time put them out. Time expired. There will be order in the house. I yield back. Well, they were talking about unity, but you didn't hear much about it. Uh, during the most impassioned parts of yesterday's debate on impeachment. President Trump's Republican allies clashing with Democrats in that heated debate on the House floor yesterday. Some of the clips there. Now, the war of words ended with Trump's second impeachment and a divided Republican Party, 10 GOP House members siding with Democrats. For more on what comes next, let's welcome in now Newsmax White House correspondent John Gizzi. John, great to see you. Where does the Republican Party, specifically, you know, with Liz Cheney signing on to impeachment here, a lot of division there, where does the GOP leadership go in the House from here? There's already an incendiary state surrounding the 10 Republicans who voted for impeachment. You mentioned Liz Cheney. Uh, two Republicans, both freshmen, have called on her to resign her position as number three in the House GOP hierarchy, that is, chairman of the House Republican Conference. She says she's staying where she is, but it's likely we're going to hear more drumbeats in what's being called Liz Wars. Meanwhile, Steve Mitchell, a veteran pollster from Michigan, said it's a foregone conclusion that Donald Trump will campaign in primaries against all of the 10 Republicans who voted for his impeachment. Within hours of the vote last night, in the state of Michigan, there was already talk about primary challenges to freshman Congressman Pete Meyer in the 3rd District, that's Grand Rapids, and longtime Congressman Fred Upton in the 4th District. As the county clerk of Allegan County, Bob Janetsky, put it, Fred Upton's going to pay for that vote. So one can expect some strong primary challenges and some strong language and involvement from a fellow named Donald Trump. John? Interesting, too, that Pete Meyer, you know, he ran and won to the seat that was held by Justin Amash, the only, well, he not, wasn't a Republican at the time, former Republican who signed on to the last impeachment challenge. So that should tell you something about that district. John, thanks for the update on that. We look forward to seeing you again very soon. All right, sure. staying with us and joining us now, GOP strategist and attorney Amanda Maki. Also with us, member of the Black Voices for Trump Advisory Board, T.W. Shannon back again. Great to see you both, T.W. and Amanda. Thanks for being with us here today. Now, during his speech against impeachment, California Republican Tom McClintock, McClintock slammed the assault on free speech. Here he is. He specifically told the crowd to protest peacefully and patriotically. And the vast majority of them did. But every movement has a lunatic fringe. Suppressing free speech is not the answer. Holding rioters accountable for their actions is the answer. You know, McClintock was dead on with his words there. You know, he really, I think, speaking for the way a lot of people feel, TW, about the way this has gone. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there is obviously a lot of tension in this country. President Trump now releasing the statement yesterday that, 
you know, a lot of people wanted him to say, but it, it's difficult now because with all this heightened tension, T.W., the one man who could really reach these people and seems willing to do so now is cut off from, from so many of his supporters. And when you see uh, the polling that Emerald talked about at the top of the hour, how much of the Republican Party supports Donald Trump still. Uh, this is not really doing anything, you know, number one, by holding an impeachment, number two, by cutting President Trump off from, him support, from his supporters. It doesn't seem like that is, uh, you know, tamping down the flames at all. Well, that's exactly right, John. The reality is this. In America, you have two types of Americans right now. You've got people who are celebrating their opponents being silenced on social media. And then you got those of us who studied history and know what it means when only one party is controlling the narrative. And that, that's, that's really what we're seeing happening across the spectrum in America. You're seeing big tech, uh, big government, uh, big corporations merge to silence the voice of those who still believe that the make America great, to, the make uh, the America first agenda is the right policy for America. You know, and you mentioned the one guy that can bring all this, this country together. Well, the one guy that can bring this country together his name is Joe Biden, and frankly, right. he's been silent. In fact, when he had a chance and an opportunity, he started talking about racism and race in America. Certainly, there can be a discussion for that, but there's also a time for healing and bringing people together. And what we saw this week was really what we've seen the last poor four years, the last four years, rather, and that's Nancy Pelosi angry at Donald Trump and running legislation, moving the body to do something against Donald Trump. But the reality is this. There's still 75 million Americans who love this country, who believe that the America First agenda is the right agenda, who have questions about election integrity, and they did not storm the Capitol. Right. Yes, those that did need to be punished. It's unconscionable that any American would do that. They should be punished and prosecuted. But this idea that there's a fractured Republican Party, I don't buy it. Just wait until we start rolling out uh, wait until Joe Biden starts rolling out his Green New Deal and AOC is leading the charge. We'll see how united the Republican Party is then. Well, that would certainly, I think, galvanize a lot of Republicans. And, you know, it's definitely not an equal fracture when you look at those poll numbers here. But if there's certainly one way, um, you know, to really troll Trump supporters or maybe get them really agitated even more, be saying something like what Missouri Democrat Cori Bush, who is a new member of Congress, said, uh, uh, during her sp speech, and here she is. The 117th Congress must understand that we have a mandate to legislate in defense of black lives. The first step in that process is to root out white supremacy, starting with impeaching the white supremacist in chief. Now, the House floor, man, is not supposed to be a place for these uh, statements of opinion. Obviously, that's, uh, you know, in vogue these days. But calling the president of the United States a white supremacist in chief isn't necessarily a symbol of uh, unity, is it? It's not. And in that 33 second speech, she called the president a white supremacist four times. Uh, it is character assassination. It is uh, a low blow and it doesn't it, it doesn't heal the country. Uh, Joe Biden is talking out of both sides of his mouth. He's saying we want to heal the country, but he's allowing Nancy Pelosi to pursue impeachment hearings. We have five days left in this presidency. What is the point of going through this exercise in futility? Uh, to me, this seems like they just want a pound of flesh. They are petty. Uh, if you had rolled the tape a little bit longer on Congressman McClintock, McClintock speech, uh, basically he said they're petty. They're, they're going after the president. And in Lincoln's speech, and what is etched on the Lincoln Memorial is malice towards none. It's time to heal the nation. I agree that the, the policies that Joe Biden and the Democrats are going to unveil is going to be a, a major boon for Republicans because we're actually going to have the ability to go after them. And in two years, the opposing party of the president typically loses. So they need to tread lightly. Yeah. But, um, you know, this is an opportunity for Republicans to move the party forward and the country forward. Well, you know, saying a white supremacist four times in, a, in that short window, I mean, look, it's in, it's incendiary also, but T.W., it's just inefficient and uh, just bad, just bad, really bad writing. So shame on her for that, uh, for, for no other reason. We got to wrap it up there. We'll see you guys again in the next hour. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, more to come with T.W., Shannon, and Amanda Maki in the next hour. Also coming up, the U.S. puts a ban on products made by forced labor camps in uh, Xinjiang, China. Plus, former Democratic presidential candidate Andrew, Ye Andrew Yang says he is running for mayor of New York City. We'll talk about those stories and more.